What's up, fighting folk? It's your boy Jack Slack, the big tuner of MMA coverage, uh, and it's Fights Gone By podcast episode 76, coming at you on a Tuesday morning. We've got a little bit of news to cover, we've got some questions to answer, and we've got some star ratings to do. So star ratings, news, back to the star ratings, as always. Get ready, get angry, here we go. Sanders vs. Williams, 2. Perez vs. Lopez, 2.5. Bulha vs. Vikovic, 3. Okami vs. Lima, 2.25. Dodson vs. Mueller, 1.75. Dorino vs. Moret, 3.5. Jotko vs. Tavares, 2.5. Hayes vs. Moraga, 3. Waterson vs. Casey, 4. Adesanya vs. Vittori, 3.75. Condit vs. Oliveira, 3.25. Gaethje vs. Poirier, 4.25. We'll talk about why uh, those were the way they were in a minute, um, but first we'll do a tiny bit of news before we carry on. So the news is related. Uh, the UFC got its fourth lowest ratings on Fox to date with this card. God knows why. The main card was really good. Um, the you know the prelims and the early prelims were a bit meh. Uh, sitting through those was hard work at at times, but generally I thought the level of this fight card was really good. Um, obviously not a huge amount of names on it, but Adesanya uh, and Gaethje versus Poria should have been enough to interest some people. Condit, maybe. I mean, he's got some diehard fans out there, but equally, he's not won a fight in years. Um, bit disappointing. Not quite as bad as Bellator, who uh, managed to get 400,000 views across two channels. Uh, so where you would expect their showing it on country music TV to attract some more people and maintain the usual viewership it seemed like half their viewership just went oh i'll watch it on country music tv because that'll be a laugh <laughs> but yeah just dreadful uh, viewership for bellator um they keep getting worse viacom can't be happy at scott coker at this point uh, and he's paying a million dollars each time he puts a fight like trail versus rampage together just in purses alone um so yeah sport's not in a good place this week <laughs> That's about it on the news front. Um, let's talk about some of these ratings then. Now, a lot of these, like, you'll notice there's only one one star fight on this selection, on this card rather, and that even that one was close to a two. You know, I was, I was close. Really, what this card had was a lot of passable fights that didn't really need to be watched. If you missed them, I wouldn't bother going back. Uh, if you were watching them, they weren't the worst thing in the world. Sanders versus Williams started out all right, and then it sort of fell into the same pace over and over again. Williams just kept backing himself onto the fence, not really doing anything, swinging the right hand. Occasionally, Sanders would eat it. Um, and the, the fight never really changed pace or gear or dynamic um, to any real degree. And yeah, it just it wound up being like a, a standard prelims fight, you know, top of a regional card maybe. Um, two up-and-comers, but nothing really impressive going on there. So I gave that a two. Um, Perez versus, versus Lopez, I thought this was a better version of the previous fight. Uh, Perez, sorry, Lopez was using pressure quite well. Uh, he was picking up these takedowns along the fence. He was attacking along the fence too. Uh, wasn't just sort of standing there staring at him, which Sanders did at various points. But um, attacked along the fence, hit some nice takedowns off that, took the back off that a couple of times. Um, but Perez weathered him and then eventually turned him around when he started to get tired on a takedown and, and battered him. Um, so an exciting finish, and it was like a more exciting version of the previous fight, so I gave it a 2.5. Bulhar versus Vichorek, which is how I'm going to presume you announced that, because I muted that fight, is this one really tested the star system, because it was a shit fight, but it had a really exciting finish. It was Frank Mir versus Krokop, basically. Um, yeah, uh, Bulhar just pushed him against the fence, kept taking him down into closed guard and doing nothing from there. And then finally, Vikoretsch, um got an omoplata, which, you know, is, is cool enough. But then he finished the omoplata, which is astounding in uh, modern MMA. Um, the omoplata, you know, I used to know this guy who uh, used to just go on and on to Twitter about how the omoplata is a worthless move. And uh, what's his name? Hannah Gracie should be ashamed for teaching uh, Leota Machida to do it or whatever. Um uh, no, the own plotter isn't work worthless, hasn't ever been worthless. The own plotter, what it is nowadays, is a great sweep in the same way that you're not going to finish people with a Kimura very often, but you can make them turn and you can pass their guard because if they sit up into you, you're going to tear their arm off. 
the omoplata, if people are slow enough to get caught on their knees in an omoplata, you've got a chance of finishing it. But most people are going to roll or scramble or stand up. Uh, and really, it's just a way to get off the bottom. So I gave that fight three because that's, a you know, we've had two omoplata finishes ever. The last one was Ben Saunders uh, in the UFC. You have to see it, but I would <laughs> I would recommend if you're listening to this before watching the fight, skip half the fight. Just go to the end. Also, this Vikoretch guy looked a lot like Sergei Haritanov, but a little bit skinnier. Okami versus Lima. I mean, we talked about this being like a favour for Okami, letting him come back. Um, and he was very boring and blanketing. I mean, he, he was all over his man. Lima was just sort of defending. Um, but then Okami never does finish fights. So you're like, is he trying to stall him from there? Is he just holding on to these positions? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was decent enough. The commentary was actually pretty fun on this fight. It sort of made it. Um, but... Otherwise, not really worth watching, unless you're keen to watch Okami blanket someone. Dodson vs. Mueller, I gave 1.75, was basically a better version of the uh, Rawlings vs. Ashley thingy Evans last week. Lots of running in spamming combinations, not a lot of really successful connections, nothing to write home about. Now, Durino vs. Moret. Uh, I I said before this fight that I I got my arm eye on Dorino. I've always enjoyed him. Uh, really exciting grappler, and and has three arm bar finishes in the UFC, which is very rare nowadays. But he's been working on this uppercut, and he he does swing for the fences. Like his striking is not getting sharper; it's just getting more confident. But uh, yeah, Moret was getting in his face early, and then uh, he dinged him, and then uh, he hit him with an uppercut along the fence, and he fell onto his own knee and double knocked himself out it was it was a violent looking knockout and, and props to Durinio for not hitting him again because other people would most other fighters would i would say um very aware of his surroundings to uh to not jump in and smash him again jotko versus tavares was what i would call a serviceable fight so i gave it 2.5 because it's not must watch it's not really like seek it out if you're desperate to watch as many fights as possible uh that's about it but um brad tavares i can't believe He's got one finish in his entire record, and it was when they allowed Phil Baroni to come back to the UFC for one fight. Um, yeah, uh, that guy is a lot scarier looking than he actually is in the cage. Um, but yeah, no, he had some good flurries here. He, I think he knocked Jocko down along the fence at one point, and uh, yeah, it was a solid technical fight, I would say. It just well, it didn't have many moments of, of top-notch excitement. I like Tavares, but it's hard to be excited for him when he never finishes. <laughs> Uh, and, and I suppose that's his problem. He can win as many fights as he wants, but if he doesn't finish people, then you know he's never going to get a following. Um, Waterson versus Casey. That's the one that I really wanted to talk about. Now let's get into a little bit more depth. I gave this four stars. Uh, I think that's my highest ever for a, uh, for a women's fight. Katzengano and Vieira the other month, um, I, I gave 3.5 or 3.75. because That was a solid fight. Really enjoyable. Um, but Waterson versus Casey was a back and forth fight. It was... Um, not just size, you know, size versus speed. Uh, people would say size versus skill, but I think Casey was beating her on skill at a lot of points in this fight. Um, obviously, the, the scorecards were a little bit contentious. A lot of people, myself included, felt like Casey probably deserved the win more um, based on the submission attempts rather than the takedowns, which led to nothing really. Um, and the fact that Casey was winning the striking exchanges on the feet. Uh, a lot of people were like, well, she was bullying her because he was she was small and, you know, I'd give more... Um, I score better for the for the smaller fighter. And really. you're like, well, no, she's choosing to compete at that weight class. Uh, obviously, Waterson, we spoke about this last week. I mean, she used to compete at atom weight. She's very small for the weight class. Casey actually cuts weight, looks good, looks big for the weight class. Um, but yeah, I liked how Waterson opened the, the fight. She came out um, Casey's orthodox, so she must have come out orthodox. She came out close guard, uh, and she was using skip up lead leg kicks, which were really nice, crisp. Uh, you don't see guys using those very well and, and circling off and uh, and using them as an outfighting weapon all that well. Um, so that was nice. Uh, I, I didn't like it when she went southpaw because she started stomping in that lead leg kick and missing it again. And every time she misses it, she puts her foot down between her opponent's legs and gives them the angle for the right hand, exactly like she did against Rose Namajunas. And she did it here a couple of times too. Uh, luckily, Casey wasn't quite as, sh- as sharp on the uh, taking advantage of it. Um, but... Waterson flicked out the jab a couple of times, and I thought, oh, that jab looks crisp, that's nice. And she was circling away, uh, and I thought, oh, could we see a striking clinic here? Um, And then the right hand started landing for Casey, and I realised, oh, wait, no, Waterson's flicking out the jab, but she's not actually moving after it. And that's the difference between a good educated jab and 
uh, just a fast jab. You know, if you can beat someone to the punch every time with the jab, but you can't do anything about their punch that's already in motion or them throwing a punch as you hit them. You know, the jab won't stop their punch. The jab might make them miss, but the whole idea is to get in, hit them, and not get hit. So you need to be moving your head after your jab. I mean, that's the whole point of having a double end bag. You, you throw your, your jabs and your right straights, and you move your head afterwards. But, um, yeah, uh, Waterson wasn't doing any of that. So you notice she got hit with the right hand over the top after her jab every single time that Casey threw it. Um, and she got stumbled by it a couple of times too. And there was a when they did actually trade, uh, she got hammered with a left hook on the end of a one-two where she just sort of dropped her hands after that too. So her boxing still very much not up to snuff. And Casey, not a great boxer, but she was at least spotting these openings to land counter punches. Actually, I'm talking about um, karate combat in my uh, next article. And one of the things we're talking about is that the left hook, the hooks were originally banned. Apparently Baz Rutten's had a go at them and they've changed it since. But I was watching one of the matches between um, Black Magic and whoever the wolf is. Um, and Oh no, it was, it was another one actually. Um, but each time they squared up to throw the right hand a la karate competition, they'd both get caught with like a left straight that was going across at an angle coming back so basically had there been left hooks allowed they both have knocked each other out but they kept getting caught with this like crossover left straight um faux left hook if you will uh because they square up and don't protect themselves and that's exactly what happened to waterson here um though i don't think she was a point fighter i have no idea what kind of karateka she was uh, a hotaka karateka apparently um, but yeah i thought that was interesting but Waterson's takedowns in this were very impressive, given the size difference. Uh, hit a lovely high crotch that DC was losing his mind over, because obviously the high crotch is DC's whole game. Um, problem was, when she got top guard position, she did nothing with it, and Casey was attacking arm bars constantly and, and triangle attempts, using the overhook well. Uh, and then she was... Waterson turned her away from the fence so that she couldn't stand up, but... Casey's legs were long enough that she could reach the fence and walk up over it into an armbar attempt and she did that like three times and I was going I don't I can't remember the last time I saw that um it might be to do with the massive leg length and small person in your guard thing but I also haven't seen it very much at all guys using the cage to walk over for an armbar when the cage is behind their opponent I think if Casey had got to elbows from the guard earlier she could have probably won the fight because she could have bloodied uh, K uh waterson up and and uh you know it's, it's a good as much as they focus on top time typically judges um as soon as you can see the blood on on the bottom man from the top man you know you know that they've been hurt and uh it, it's got a good psychological effect at least on fans and uh, and judges plus the elbows are just the most useful thing you can do from the bottom that isn't up kicking uh, and up kicking is, unless you're doing it to the chest, it's illegal. Under unified rules of MMA, at least. Shouldn't be, but is. Shouldn't be because I like up kicking. Not, not shouldn't be because it doesn't make sense within the rule set. But I thought this was a good fight. I thought Casey probably deserved it because she all the striking exchanges were Casey's. Um, I mean, all the meaningful strikes that landed were Casey's. Uh, and all the offense on the ground was Casey's. The only thing that Waterson really controlled was the transition between the two. But close fight, you know, only three rounds, doesn't really matter. Watch it because it was a good fight. Second best fight on this card. Adesanya versus Vittori. We talked about Vittori last week a little bit, just about how he has a, a good body kick uh, and is sort of like a scrappy banger. Um, you know, he was he's touted as a striker, but he's very much more a, a hard-nosed sort of striker than Adesanya. Um, and this was a, a really enjoyable fight. I gave this 3.75. Obviously no finish, and everyone was hoping for Adesanya to just sort of run through everyone. But Vittori... Gave him trouble, um, just by being awkward, by either being, uh, like, tentative when uh, Adesanya expected him to be coming forwards, or coming forwards when Adesanya thought he had him on the back foot. Uh, if you if you watch it, Adesanya just seemed to have a hard time dealing with this strange man. <laughs> he reminds me a little bit of um, either Marcus Maidana or Oscar Ben, uh, what's his name, Bonaveda. But basically, like, a, a bit of a weird, awkward, octopus-like man. Uh, and uh, yeah he did he did really well but um Adesanya looked really good tons of feints uh, the thing that I was finding with this was I was like do I write someone you know uh, do I write him into the post fight article can I be bothered to go through him and, and make a gif of all the feints and stuff and the thing about Adesanya is that he's fainting so often that it's not like I'm not going to be able to 
you can show a feint directly setting up a technique, but when the guy is using feints so often that he's just trying to numb the guy, that really doesn't lend well to a short clip. So what I'd say is just watch the fight, count how many feints he throws in like a minute, uh, or shows rather, in like a minute, and um, and you know, you'll, you'll get an idea of what he's doing so well. You're never really sure when Adesan is coming in. When he goes in, uh, he hides it very well, and uh, he has good variety in his strikes. And you notice in this fight too, he was leaving the uh, leaving range, retreating a lot on 45s, changing stances. He did so. That's very much an MMA thing. You won't see that in um, boxing so much, but it is. It's a very effective way to land counter strikes and draw the opponent out into overextension. There was a really good, like, some Brazilian guy who wasn't a great striker before, but just had worked out those 45s. Uh, and he had a fight in the UFC a little while ago. I can't remember who he was against. But he just kept sort of changing stances, going back on those 45s and hammering the guy with counter punches. Uh, and it was really nice. Very useful principle. Leave range on the 45s and, and try and change stances as you do so. Obviously, you don't want to change... If you're orthodox, you don't go 45 degrees back to your right while changing stances. You go 45 degrees back to your left while changing stances. Um, and vice versa. There was a really nice. Uh, he caught the kick. Can't remember if it was a if it was a straight parry off the forearm or if he cupped it underneath and caught it and dragged it. But he did a lovely little like leg drag across the body uh, with the kick, and then he hammered in a, a body shot on the same side. If you watch um, Boaka, Boaka made a career of catching kicks, dragging them across, and coming back with boxing combinations. Um, Giorgio Petrosian does some nice ones. He'll take the kick on his forearm start dragging it across his body but drop it at about six o'clock and come straight up with the uppercut with the lead hand um really cool when he seen him do that but uh, yeah catching kicks and and dragging them is a great way to uh to get in with combinations because if you pull the opponent's leg across himself and you're not like letting him go so that he can spin wildly into something if you just drag him across himself and towards you a little bit you are putting him on a uh he's giving up a dominant angle to you basically you haven't moved your feet you've moved his feet and turned him it's a, it's a unique situation, but it's very it, it works the same as you walking around to a dominant angle. With the added bonus that he's on one leg while you're dropping it. <laughs> Condit versus Oliveira. Fair play to Carlos Condit. Did all right. You know, Oliveira is not um, a super sharp technician. He's a bit of a brawler. Um, but he got Condit down early, and then he was, he was working all over him, and Condit got to the fence and started wall walking up. And... Oliveira just sort of stood up and started swinging at him and got taken down. It was kind of the, a reminder that Oliveira is rough around the edges quite a lot. Uh, and Carlos Condit, while he doesn't really have it anymore, he's still, um, well, we, I used to call him and Campman and guys like that just top opportunists. You know, if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. Um, and, and he's always been very good at that. If you leave him some space he'll take control of the fight or he'll just finish the fight very quickly. So he gave uh, Condit this unnecessary chance and Condit got on top of him for the rest of the round and a lot of people gave Condit the round as a result. Um, but in the next round, uh, Oliveira caught him in a guillotine, guillotine very, very tight. Uh, it was one of those ones where people thought, oh, okay, it's not a threat anymore, but Condit was just holding out as long as he possibly could uh, before, before tapping. Um, so good work by Oliveira. Condit really done as a top welterweight, let's be honest. Uh, and I, I felt that way for a while. I, to be honest, he's been on the decline since long before he fought Robbie Lawler and surprised everyone in that title fight. Uh, that was sort of a break with his form. And he's done the you know classic, oh, I don't know if I still have it in me, aftermath stuff, because he's retired about three times now and, and come back every time. But I think it's time for him to either... He's either got to hang it up or the UFC have got to start matching him against much lower opponents and then he won't be the draw that he should be because, you know, you can't have Condit versus... Um, who's a really lowly welterweight? <laughs> no idea, but you can't have Condit versus some guy you've never heard of and put it as the co-main event. And he doesn't want to get into a... T uh, what's it called? A Diego Sanchez situation where he's the name but he's pa you know, padding people's records and just getting beaten up. Finally, the uh, main event between Gaethje and Poirier. Really, really fun fight. Not quite as fun if, if you didn't want to see Gaethje get knocked out again, but I think this fight... We talked about it last week, and I talked about it in my pre-fight article. The difference between Gaethje and Poirier is that Poirier has reached the point in his career where he realised, OK, I can't fight the same way every fight. I can't just fight however I want to every fight. I have to fight to my opponent at this level of the game. Um, whereas Gaethje is still very much riding his natural talents and the, and the stuff that he already has. 
And you'll notice with Gaethje, he's become a lot more one note. He's worked out... It used to be that he was this terrifying wrestler with heavy hands, and he'd worked out that he could low kick guys by timing them off their jab or whatever, uh, and, and really hurt them. But now all he does is low kick and throw the occasional right hook. Yeah, I, I really wish Gaethje would... Uh, well, Gaethje could benefit from a heap of different things, but learning to use his jab, because he flicked the jab in, in both Poirier and Alvarez and uh, Johnson's eyes, he landed good jabs on all of them, he just barely ever used it, and never when he landed it did he get in off it, he threw the jab as its own weapon on its own, uh, as as a as a punch, you know, and the jab should be, exactly as his teammate Rose Namajunas uses it, a tool, she flicks it out in their face and she's already in behind it or away behind it you know it's in their eye and then she's in a different position and he doesn't do that and that would be so much easier for him to get in off those jabs uh, the other thing was that he threw 212 strikes and only 12 were to the body you know so he's a guy who appreciates attrition and he used to go to the body a lot especially along, along the fence but he's a guy who pr- appreciates the uh, the attrition because he goes to the legs constantly but he's also completely blinkered on the legs because he's not throwing anything to the body at all uh, and if he threw some combinations with his hands if he went with a nice right straight to the body against the south paws or uh, a jab to the body or ended his combinations with a left hook to the body and then threw the low kick and that's another thing we need to talk about like there are two really good times to land the low kick per Ernesto Hoost, uh, and he's probably the authority on this, but Hoost said, on the end of combinations, which is the one that every Dutch kickboxer in the world uses, and when the opponent steps in and plants their foot, and that's the one that Gaethje uses, and catches a lot of guys by surprise, but if he only uses it, they now know it's coming. So you saw Poirier waiting on the low kick, he was jabbing or whatever, going into range, waiting for the low kick, and then pounding him with the left straight while he was on one leg. And if you watch Gaethje's fights with Pal- uh, Palomino and Johnson, the times that he's been hurt, knock off Eddie Alvarez, because a lot of body work was what did it uh, did it for Alvarez, and a really nice jab and stuff. But if you the main times he's been hurt by like one punch, he's been on one leg, because he kicks so often, and guys either time him by accident, or as Poirier did, wait for him and then time him. Uh, and it meant that Poirier ate a lot of low kicks while he was doing it, but he was also coming off a lot better in many of those exchanges because he was just waiting on the low kick, throwing the left hand down the centre. And it was Poirier who went to the takedowns. You know, didn't actually. I don't think he scored any, but he we went to them and kept uh, Gaethje guessing. You know, Gaethje was struggling to cut the ring, um, and when he did, he wasn't really doing much with it. He was throwing one low kick and getting countered. Uh, and you know, these these are the times that even faking the takedown is useful. When he got to the fence, he didn't really do anything with it. He just held on to the single collar tie until Dustin pushed him off or, or angled out. Um, he just looked like a guy who had fallen into thinking that he'd found one way to deal with everything. And that's how his defense comes off, too. He is clearly not scared of getting hit. Uh, so covering up and crouching, you know, curling the head forward and just taking all the blows on the top of his head is really just laziness. It's looking for a one-size-fits-all answer rather than... Uh, learning to move his head, get into better positions, look for openings, uh, or or limit the exchange with his footwork. It's uh, if you're doing the catch and pitch all the time, it's ne- it's not going to work out that you get less damage than the opponent, uh, and it's not a great way to fight going forward. And obviously he knows that, but um, it's just kind of frustrating to watch him not realize his mistakes. I mean, honestly, the body shots would still be a massive problem, but if he wants to just guard his head, he'd be better off just going to a cross guard. Uh, he could be, like, the first person to use the cross guard effectively in MMA. Don't say you're Romero. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then they wouldn't be able to claim it as the 52 because he is a pasty motherfucker. You know, the double forearms guard is, is pretty ineffective in MMA anyway because you, you don't have big gloves on. You don't have anything stopping the top end of your arm from just smashing into your head every time you get hit. Um... And you can always shoot around it. I mean, Poirier did it nicely in this fight. And Poirier knows that because Poirier did the exact same thing against Conor McGregor. And Conor McGregor swung a long left hand in around his guard and knocked him down. Static defense is never good. You know, the the times that Gaethje's stuff worked was when he ducked in and pushed in on uh, Poirier when Poirier attacked. Uh, smothered the distance, closed the distance, gave him a nodder. There were a couple of cheeky nodders in this. He, uh, he smashed his head into Dustin's f- uh, face a couple of times. But... There's no way of just standing there and soaking up blows on the guard does not work for anyone. It will very quickly fail. Um, and, you know, he, he did look better against uh, Johnson and he's moving his head a little bit and tilting his his elbows and stuff. But if you're only showing the one look, everyone knows what you're going to do.
Very, very frustrating fight to watch. I mean, Gaethje's at a crossroads. He could be... I mean, he'll always beat the, the not great guys, like Nate Diaz. The book's been written on him for years, but if you don't come in very, very smart and very good, you're not going to beat him. Um, but Gaethje could be a top lightweight. Ga- Gaethje could have beaten Poirier and Alvarez. You know, the thing that cost him the fight was how he fights, not his natural talents. But enough focusing on Gaethje. Uh, let's talk about Poirier for a bit. Lovely stuff in this fight. Couple of really nice left hands to the body, left straight to the body, come up with the right uppercut to the head. Uh, used the left uppercut perfectly when Poirier, uh, when Gaethje was ducking forward, um, obviously because you don't want to hit the top of the head, but if they duck forward, you've got the front of their face uh, angled nicely into the uppercut. Um, and he used a lot of tap, tap, tap with the lead hand and then followed up with combinations, which is what you want to do if you know the guy's just going to cover up. You keep him covered so that he can't come back with that counter right hand. Did he a counter right hand in the third, which basically changed the whole round. Um, Gaethje turned his chin round. So fair play to Dustin because he took a full flush shot on the chin with Gaethje's right hand. Uh, went to the fence, sort of lost the end of the round, but then came back in the fourth to quickly stop him. I thought I thought Poirier looked great here. You know, he's still got some flaws, he's still got some holes, but fighting, well, not necessarily like, like this, but fighting the way that he has against uh, Pettis and Alvarez and Gaethje, where he changes his approach for the opponent, he is a very, very dangerous fighter because he hits hard, he's got decent enough boxing, he's learning to defend himself much better and he's thinking about it more, or rather keeping a, his mind on it more. Um... And he's got uh, Black Belt and BJJ and, and really good ground skills too. So if he fights specifically for his opponent, I think he's one of the very best fighters in the world at his weight. Um, and that's obviously proven now. But uh, he is now stuck in this ongoing clusterfuck at the top of the lightweight division though because they're not going to let him fight uh, Habib when they've got Connor lined up. They're not going to let him fight Connor when they've got Habib Connor lined up. So they might let him fight Tony Ferguson, and Tony Ferguson gets fucked over fighting another tough top contender while uh, Conor McGregor waits for his fight with Habib or, or whatever. Um, yeah, the lightweight division's really putting me off at the moment because there's so much. Like next week, we've got um, Barboza versus Kevin Lee, two top 10 lightweights or top 15. I don't know what. Barbos is ranked at now, but you've got two of the top lightweights in the world. Two two weeks in a row, you've had four top lightweights, uh, and you know if you include Chandler, which we don't really because he's not actually going to make any difference to these UFC matchups. But top lightweights fighting all the time, and the guy who's supposed to be at the top is is out of action for a year, and the the other guy only fought Ally Quinta and was crowned the number one lightweight in the world. Ah, oh, silly, silly stuff. Well, he should fight Barboza, but you know. Got a good question about that later, actually. But anyway, I didn't quite get as excited for this as I did for Bokniak versus Zabit the, uh, last week, but it was certainly a fight of the year contender. I mean, definitely fight of the night, easy. And and that's what makes Justin Gaethje his money. You know, they pay him the amount of money they pay him because he is guaranteed these exciting fights. However, they he's done well on his last three being put on um, Fox events, and I think that's how they wanted to use him, but they obviously failed to do something right with this one because almost nobody watched it. And I think if people knew how Gaethje fights went, they they would have. So I don't know how they failed to market this one properly, but they probably did. Um, either that or people are getting sick of Justin Gaethje, which I just can't imagine. You know, They still watch Diego Sanchez hoping for a war, even though he hasn't given a war in years. Um, so yeah, who knows? But 4.25, not bad. Right, let's do some questions and then we'll get out of here for today and we'll come back either Thursday or Friday for a preview of the weekend's events. Hi Jack, I've heard Faraz Zahabi essentially say the incorporation of modern grappling will be the next big technique wave to hit mixed martial arts. With the debut of Gary Tonnen and possibly other nouveau grapplers, uh, how do you see this effect- affecting the takedown game in MMA? More leg entanglement entries like we've seen Gary in his grappling competition, such as the uh, leg scissor takedowns or exposing his back standing for rolling attacks. Uh, Single leg X entries off the high crotch or double leg attempts a la Palhares. Better setups for Imanari rolls or similar inversions than currently seen? Question mark. Uh, Thanks. Love the podcast. Hope you answer. Otherwise, I'll have to ask Shorb uh, from Chris. Yeah, um, the I mean, I like I enjoyed the Imanari role coming in. I think it's a great way for someone who doesn't have the wrestling pedigree but still needs to get the fight to the ground to to actually get in on his man. Uh, you have to, obviously a lot of guys aren't combining it with good ring craft and footwork, um, but I think 
it's just another string to your bow. If you've got takedowns and Imanari rolls, you're doing great. Um, leg scissors, I think I could see that coming in. I, I'd be interested to see leg scissors as um, a counter to, to single legs and things like that, because you can always um, try and... Well, Ryan Bader used to do it a lot in his uh, wrestling career. He used to hit like a, a backdrop sort of thing. Um, but I think you weren't allowed to use the, the leg scissors, so he had to actually underhook the opponent's near leg and then fall back. But yeah, you can you can pick up some leg scissors to take down attempts off single legs. Um, seeing guys going to the, to the saddle more might be interesting. I think there's still a fear of losing the leg, because if you are... Um, grappling without spats and without knee supports and things like that, and, and you're sweaty and uh, and you've got to worry about the guy punching you as soon as he gets out. Um, it's a lot scarier to go for leg leg attempts, leg entanglements. If you saw um, any of the new John Danaher stuff, because he's he's starting to come out a lot more and and, and be open about the leg lock stuff, because um, he's got a DVD coming out soon. But if you've seen any of the recent stuff, he does a there's a great clip of him online demonstrating how to get to. Um, the single leg entanglement via the X guard from De La Hiva. Uh, and it's, it's all about getting elbow deep and, and doing the, the underhook De La Hiva, um, which was a hit in competition for a while before um, they started calling it for, for a knee reap um, when you uh, have the De La Hiva in and you underhook the ankle and you start pulling it that way to turn the opponent's knee in and try and do like a baby bolo. Um <laughs> Guy O'Terry used to do hit a lot, a lot of back takes off that, and then they said, "No, you're reaping the leg, mate." Um, but now there's like the underhook De La Hiva game where you're just holding your leg and you're not actually applying pressure inwards on the knee. Um, but yeah, Danaher talks about it in the, at the start of that video, and he just says, "You know, inside control is the key to getting a leg entanglement. Uh, you know, like anything where your feet are on the inside line. So uh, butterfly hooks, it's half guard with a butterfly hook, things like that." Um, except half of the guards that we use have some form of outside control, so you've got to pummel your feet in somehow. And De La Hiva is an obvious example, but you don't see that much De La Hiva in MMA. However, the main guard in MMA is closed guard, and you aren't going to entangle someone's legs from there. And entangling people's legs from the top, generally you're not going to see that in MMA because there's so many more advantages to being on top in terms of striking uh, and perception too. But from closed guard, you are like the furthest you'll ever be from getting a leg entanglement. What I am intrigued to see in the future of MMA grappling is how many fighters start turning themselves towards the centre of the cage rather than trying to wall walk. Because guys like Habib and uh, Phil Davies and uh, there's a few others nowadays that just excel at catching guys as they try and wall walk up. I mean, Maya takes backs off the wall walk, basically. Um, it'd be interesting to see how many guys try and turn themselves back towards the centre of the cage and, and use more traditional guard techniques. Uh, and then, you know, push the opponent off them towards that fence. Um, compared to now where a lot of guys are still scooting to the fence. I mean, you saw Carlos Condit do it, scooted to the fence, put his butt against it, started walking up. And Oliveira just jumped up and started swinging at him. But uh, a lot of guys nowadays are very good at controlling and trying to catch something or, or transition to the back as you will walk up. Or catch the wrist behind the back and collapse it a la Habib. Compare that to, like, Brian Ortega's guard game, which is almost nothing to do with the wall walk. It relies on being out in the open, and he's constantly pulling guys forward with his abs from closed guard, constantly breaking them down. They tripod up on him, he pushes them away by the face, and then lets them drop on the elbow. Um, a very... I would say it's, it's not a, a usual sort of guard at all. It's not what we see nowadays. Most of the time, guys are focused on getting back up because you lose so much... Uh, on the scorecards if you stay on the bottom for the entire round. I think with the focus, the new focus on damage in the score system um, and the damage that you can do from the bottom with elbows, uh, if you do them right, I think we'll see a lot more guys just attacking from their backs and waiting for the opponent to give them the opportunity to stand up in the open um, rather than desperately scooting towards the fence and trying to power their way up uh, with a wall walk. Well, I mean, finesse their way up, but you know, you're using a, it's a strong motion getting up along the fence. Um, whereas if you're elbowing a guy in the head constantly, he's going to, he might just give you the chance to stand up quickly. And the downside, of course, is that M MMA grappling is quite a long way from, uh, M from no-gi grappling, uh, even, you know, even submission only. Because a lot of them key guards, like reverse De La Hiva, I can count on like, one hand, the number of times I've seen the reverse De La Hiva take a, a, an important role in 
uh, high level MMA fights recently um, because you know it's the halfway house to the knee slice pass because everyone opens the guard or stands in the guard or approaches the guard and immediately goes to the knee slice you put in the reverse de la Hiva, oh we're fighting from here now and it's a fight to either get underneath them or get back to the de la, force them back into the de la Hiva, or they'll force forward um and that's where a lot of the battles happen and that's just not a, a thing that happens in mma it's interesting it's interesting like because obviously, like Gary Tonin and Gordon Ryan are going to be good enough in areas that aren't the reverse del heaver and the leg entanglements that they'll be powerful grapplers in MMA. But a lot of what they do is um, just a, a non-factor, really. You don't get in, into positions to do that unless you really force them, I suppose. Like A lot of competition grappling positions come about or become the meta because both guys can work from there. You know, it's It's a position where you can stall the top guy in his... Um, desire to to advance and start to work on your own stuff, but he can also normally stall you out there. So that's where most of these positions like reverse de la Hiva come from. I'll tell you what I would love to see in MMA, and it isn't, I suppose, the grappling technique, but if you if you ever watched Kung Lee's San Xiao career, uh, firstly, it's kind of bollocks because a lot of it is just him fight him wrestling against guys who have never taken a San Xiao fight and are actually just kickboxers. Um, but he used to hit a he'd miss a side kick with his lead leg and step past the opponent and then spin into a scissor leg takedown. It was amazing. Uh, I would love to see that in MMA. Wouldn't, I mean, it's not like the most uh, useful thing in the world. It's not going to change the meta, but as soon as someone does it, I'll lose my mind. I would like to see more guys, if they are good on uh, the legs um, and aren't able to take their opponent down, pick up the single and get in underneath them, as you said, Pell Harris does. But if you watch like Craig Jones's ADCC run, a lot of it was he'd attack the legs, they'd invert or, or spin over to try and stop him from tearing their heel off, and then he'd come up holding the leg and he'd be on top. And if you can do that to a wrestler who you can't take down, suddenly you've got a takedown via pulling guard and trying to heel hook them. Or pulling a leg entanglement, rather. Anyway, thanks, Chris. Jack, am I the only one on the planet who thinks that Habib is a male Ronda Rousey pre-Holly Holm? The circle joke about Habib is insane. I read a group of Redditors today talking themselves into saying Habib actually has good striking, uh, but it just looks bad. Uh, it's insane. What other completely deluded hype trains do you remember? Who is going to be Habib's Holm? Uh, your Patreon boy, Huck. And then Huck sent me a second email saying, obviously irate, saying, I mean, they gave him the undisputed lightweight championship while the belt was, wasn't was unified for beating the number 11 guy. They didn't care who he beat. Habib could have beat off and Dana would have slapped the belt around his waist while already taking a mental count of the gate for Habib versus Connor. Sorry to come back to this and flood your inbox. I just have a tough time with the level of delusion. Yeah, I mean... If you can't accept that some of this is hype about Habib, you are you're missing it. You know, it's the same with Ngannou. Well, Ngannou is actually probably the worst in recent memory because there wasn't a lot he'd shown. They'd specifically picked two guys who get knocked out a lot. The most knockout losses in MMA history. I said that very Trumpianly. Uh, the most knockout losses in MMA history between the two of them, um, or sorry, UFC history between the two of them, uh, and they put him in against Nganu because if Nganu hit them, they'd go down. They didn't put him in against, um, you know, the tough gatekeepers like Verdum and stuff. They just put him in with two chinny guys uh, who were good. You know, they're good fighters, but they are also ultra chinny. Uh, and then that became, oh my God, this guy's a monster. He's a killer, blah, blah, blah. And nobody had really seen what he was actually capable of against good opponents um, who could keep him going for more than a round. I think Zabit is getting there with the hype train because people are seeing stuff that isn't there. I've seen a lot of guys just talking about his, his high-level striking when actually they mean flashy striking. You know, high-level for me means things set up other things. He's showing looks that set up other looks and blah, blah, blah. Just spinning for kicks and shit and, and throwing the same jab and, jab and pivoting off the same direction every time doesn't say to me high-level striking. It says to me uh, competent striking and high-level athleticism. Um, but we'll see. You know, when he gets into fights with better opponents, you know, he'll have to... Um, uses his uh, fight IQ a little bit more, but yeah, Habib's in the same position. I like I was. <laughs> someone was telling me this the other day. They were like, "Well, you can't just use footwork against Habib. If he misses the clinch, he'll clinch again." And blah blah blah. And they said about five different things. Uh, like, "Oh yeah, you you know, are you gonna are you gonna hit him once and, and knock him out? You don't have the one punch knockout power." Blah blah blah. And the list of things that he said perfectly matched up with the list of this incredulous guy. 
uh, getting angry about my killing the Queen Ronda Rousey piece before she fought Holly Holm, and then it literally happened. Um, you know, people delude themselves. Like the most, the thing that everyone focuses on, both on the positive and on the negative spectrum side of it, is you know, if you if you want to hype up a prospect who's not done much but has knockout power, oh, it only takes one. And if you want to hype up someone who doesn't have very good ring craft and runs face first into clinches, uh, you know, well, he, he, does he have one punch power? Will he be able to stop him with the one punch? No, it's not about one landing one punch. It's about trying to land as many times as possible and making it hard to get to the clinch while landing in between. You know, it, it's bizarre, this focus on one punch knockout power, even when it clearly doesn't matter. Plus, with guys like Habib and Ronda, the running into the clinch, you know, the sprinting after people, gives force to the car crash. You're running onto their punch. Holly Holm, not a hitter. Against Ronda Rousey, a hitter. Regarding <laughs> Habib's striking, I mean, I like that he's willing to strike, and he, obviously he has these guys feeling flustered and overwhelmed, like Barbosa, he was landing some good shots on him. Um, but yeah, no, it's not anything special at all. Uh, it's serviceable. Uh, and the fact that he jabbed up Al Iaquinta was more to do with Al squatting in like a baseball catcher's stance, desperate to stop the, the takedowns, and that's why you saw Habib diving on those very low singles and and then throwing out this spammy jab. Um, is he a, a very good striker? No. <laughs> but, but does it matter? Might not. Might not at all, to be honest. Yes, it's a hype train, um, but you can't tell people that before he loses because we have to have something to be excited about. It's like Ngannou. You can't be like, eh, haven't seen his gas tank. What if he gasses out in a round? And people are like, oh, stop being such a buzzkill. He's not gassed up till now, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, let's just enjoy it. Let's enjoy the, the Connor versus Habib madness and uh, the two million pay-per-views we hope it sells and uh, enjoy our book sales. Oh, well, I, I will at least. <laughs> Cheers, Huck, you the man. And I reckon that'll do us for the first podcast of this week. Uh, on the subject of books by Notorious, uh, if you're not a Patreon boy, consider signing up to the Patreon. I, I have literally just put down Tito Ortiz's awfully written biography, autobiography, air quotes, autobiography, um, <laughs> to do this episode. Uh, it's it's getting fun. The whole Lion's Den thing, I forgot how mental they were. Um, well, I knew how they meant. You, you forgot just how bad things were there. Um, and, you know, we get to touch on Frank Shamrock and, and uh, the genuinely good fighter of that time. Uh, and Jerry Bolander, actually. He was very underrated. But yeah, if you want to get in on that, sign up to the Patreon. Uh, it allows me to do these podcasts, sometimes two a week, if I'm feeling particularly vim and vigor. If you have an email to send to the podcast, fightsgonebypodcast at gmail.com. And if you haven't bookmarked the Fight Primer, that's where you can find everything I'm doing at the moment. Uh, I'm your boy, Jack Slack. This has been the Fights Gone By podcast. And I will catch you later in the week. Cheers!